we sometimes forget our history. I mean, uh, we forget that the humankind were hunter-gatherers. Uh, that's how the human humans went around the earth as, as hunters and gatherers and, um, and slowly settled uh, with agriculture coming and uh, settled into settlements, what we call settlements. And in this whole process, the exchange of goods, what we call the market, is a much later phenomenon. But uh, what is interesting is that this is not just historical, it's not dinosaurs that they were there and they finished. There's a large part of this world which still transacts in that mode of um, non-market uh, possession of goods. And um, from the area from the, of the world that I come from, India, and if you take India and China together, you're talking of something like 70 percent people in India and China, which will add up to nearly more than 1.5 billion people, who are still uh, related to land, whose, whose life is still in relation to land as um, small farmers, as marginal farmers, as big farmers, or as farm labor. So, so we're talking of that, which uh, is very different to imagine perhaps in Europe today. And when you have populations of that kind, uh, and as it happens in, in reality, they're not living a dinosaur world. And a lot of that world is still the same, where um, common property resources, as we say, land, water, um, forest produce, um, timber, firewood, uh, grass uh, as fodder is available as a common property resource which people share. It's not based on private monopoly or market transactions, though there is a market penetration in a little bit, but a lot of it is still that. Now in that sense, nature uh, and natural products are not near, nearly there for scenic beauty and you want to go and see a waterfall and so on. They, they are the basics of livelihood of people. Now, um, therefore, over a period of time, um, a systems of laws have been crafted in which there's a lot of dispossession of these resources from those people and uh, disposition without giving them alternatives. I mean, you, if you take the water, their right to take water from a river away from them, they don't have access to municipal water. So what, 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 how will they survive? So it becomes a survival question. And um, therefore, there are lots of conflicts in it, which is a conflict of control and use of resources. Whose control and whose use is more important? An example I was trying to give of the Chipko Andolan. Chipko literally means to hug of these women who hugged the trees in order that they were not clear felled uh, because they used the branches for their own cooking food as firewood. Uh, it, it typifies this conflict of resources of is it necessary for the industry as timber or is it necessary as firewood. There's a very deep conservation question involved in that. When, when you use it uh, for timber, you cut it from the, from, from the bottom which means you finish the tree. But on the other hand, when they use it for their firewood, they take the branches which regenerate. So, so there is a great deal of... Uh, so therefore, you know, environmentalism is not merely um, conserving for, for, for purity and nicety. It is a matter of conserving for use uh, for one's own. So the economic systems, what we call the subsistence economic systems, based on crop, common property resources, become a very important part for a very large population on this earth. Not just in India and China, but, but in Thailand, in, in the Philippines, in Indonesia, in, in South Asia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, but non-European. Europe, Europe uh, was at that stage somewhere far back. Now, it is this imagination what we need to use to understand that commons as, as nature, common property resources uh, as related to nature, um, have a conflict in terms of who has the right and for what kind of need. And the market penetration here has created a particular problem because the market wants exactly the same resources. It wants water, it wants uh, minerals, so it has to mine, it needs timber, and it needs land. So we have a new actor coming in into this conflict which was previously between the state and the community 
Now it's a state community and the market. And market facilitated either through the state or market just buying it off the people directly. And in India, this has become a very major, major question. And a lot of social movements in India are about people who don't want to give up their land, they don't want to give up their water, they don't want to give up their forests for uh, neoliberal uh, economic expansion. And uh, some of the most heroic struggles uh, there come from here. And I think the more difficult political question is, for example, when you have trade unions who are also resistances to this order, but trade unions look for employment. And employment means you want to set up factories, you want to do mining. And when, when, you, when people are resisting, it's the trade unions who have a very difficult task of saying that, should we support it or should we oppose it? And you have, you have this being played out in them. And one of the greatest political challenges for us in India has been to create unities between trade unions and these social movements. To say that at risk, is a process of livelihood and that livelihood has a root which is from a factory worker but that livelihood also has a root from the commons and we must unite in this fight so that we have a balance between industrial um, um, wage earning and, and commons and we should not be fighting against each other because our common uh, enemy is a neoliberal order which is doing it. And that's, that's the kind of political challenge we have in India for the left. Because left is not necessarily engaged with these kind of questions which are you know, non-production questions in that sense. Yeah, now, the question of course comes all the time and the question is also true for India and China which are urbanizing at very high levels and as urbanization goes, question is that when you are in urban setups where the commons are not in your vicinity, how do you live there? What do you do there? Now, it's quite clear that in, in urban settlements, you cannot use the same yardsticks uh, as you would use for these uh, um, uh, decentralized rural communities who are living very close to that. You will have to transport. So you will have to transport water. You will have to find land for housing. Uh, you will have to clear forests. And you will have to take away agricultural land for that. So it's quite clear you need to do that. The question, I think, is the question for civilization is, can 7 billion people of this earth live in human settlements of that kind where everything has to be brought and through obviously when it's brought then exchange of commodities through market forces and you can can you sustain it one it makes it quite clear that whether it is through state enterprises or through market mechanisms you will have an exchange of, of market of some kind or other, either under state capitalism or under market capitalism. So you cannot have relations of the older kind which, which subsisted when it was a free resource. The second is sustainability. I mean, um, a city like New Delhi, which is about 17 million people, how are you going to sustain this uh, uh, supply of water, of sanitation, of uh, land for space for parking cars and, and, and all that that goes with it. My own view is that um, mega cities are not sustainable uh, settlements for future. They cannot be. We have to find ways of decentralized living. Decentralized living where um, the old order of having uh, cities around factories, that's how cities came up, around factories, uh, have to be seen in new forms of production in which uh, you might have centralized production but you have um, uh, dispersed populations. Now, that will require transportation. But I think the Gandhian idea here is, is, is very relevant, which is the essentials of life should be produced in a decentralized manner. The essentials of life, food, clothing, these are essentials of life. They have to be decentralized. So I think from the monolithic mega transnational corporations we have to look at uh, i'm not saying about you know the railway engines and turbines they will have to be centralized but essentials of life if they are 
decentralized in terms of production uh, and therefore available through much more friendly market mechanisms which can also make dispersed set set settlements possible is to my way, uh, mind not only an environmental way to go ahead which is important in environmental climate change and other terms but it is probably also important in terms of political ways in which uh, populations can sustain themselves productively and have uh, access to uh, their survival needs, uh, uh, not from very distant um, areas. And I, when you combine this with the question of climate change, this is probably the only way to go. Well, you know, um, you, we're now getting into very um, difficult gray areas because, um, again, like the more modern uh, um, mind, which looks at um, nature as a resource for its use, there exists in this world um, a larger number of people who look at um, nature not only a resource, but uh, nature as something which is uh, more than resource. It is part of their cultural life. So therefore, uh, you will find that yes, there are lots of people who want to migrate to a city because it has attractions, it can give more employment, it can do, but there's a large number of po large population which does act not want to give up land because land has a relation which is different from merely uh, something you can trade and market. Uh, as as the indigenous people say when you tell them that why why don't you give up your land because the government wants it for some factory and they say well how can we give up our land the, this land has the bones of our elders in it so it's not only a piece of uh, material for us it's uh, it's culturally so important to us because this is sacred to us how can we give up that land in this relationship of uh, nature which is caught now in imagination of people with um, you know bringing in the notion of pachamama the mother earth uh, uh, in bolivia in india we call it dhartima this cultural relationship in many ways in india uh, also takes a, a religious route where 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 this uh, a river and water and land and tree have a certain sacredness they're sacred they're not only something that you cut for your work but but you preserve them because they're they're part of the nature now i think they both compete the need to migrate because you have a better life but the need to be there not because you are rooted only historically but because there is something uh, very uh, humanly close affinity with that in these cultural terms they both interplay and in India, I found that some of the most um, um, resilient movements against giving up this, when you ask them, very, very ordinary women who, who are very poor, and you tell them what keeps on going to, to in their fight, and they say, well, well, we, we can't give up this mother. This river is our mother. How can we give up this mother? So there is a different way of expressing this relationship. Now, obviously, there has been our historically dispossession of of that what would be a compromise between the two i mean to me yes of course everyone must have a basic amount of education electricity health services there has to be basic minimum for everyone and that will come from centralized systems that will not come from but is it possible to have that basic minimum along with a decentralized population that is living in harmony with nature so that we don't get into the end of the world scenarios like climate change and so on is that is that possible i would say that we have reached a stage in human civilization where we should not be afraid of these dreams it's dreams but we should we should be keeping them up front rather than getting bogged down in only the practical day-to-day uh, -day things of you know uh, what is World Bank doing and IMF doing and the government doing and austerity majors that's that's important that's immediate to me the radical left of the future is a radical left which combines these concerns between resources distribution of resources uh, longevity of the earth because if, if we have a climate change catastrophe of five degrees everything is going to change agriculture is going to change food is going to change and let's also remember that you may have large populations living in cities and having the city comforts of whatever they need food 
food still comes from land unless we have factories producing all our food which is distant someone has to produce that food in some kind of land and therefore you're not going to get away from the needs of of that land and and irrigation and water and so on and some people who do it as i was as, as i keep on saying one of the biggest disruptions in the world is the disruption between the consumer and the producer and we have a class which produces and a huge class that consumes and this relationship has become more and more violent I, I, I really think that the way to the future of, of harmonizing uh, the world is to have everyone being a part producer and not being just a consumer and in India for example forget about um, the, the rural 500 million I mean more many large populations living in cities who have their houses and their uh, rich will have a patch of land where they're ma making their own vegetables and this is a common phenomenon in india the most rich and elite uh, will will not only keep a beautiful lawn there will be a bit of beautiful lawn there will be a patch where they're growing their own tomatoes and their own um, eggplants and 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 other vegetables I, I i really think that we need to we need to resurrect these kind of things it's not enough only to have your backyard for parking your car you do that but in the backyard have a patch we are also producing your organic vegetables and you're not looking for exotic organic vegetables which are coming from Europe and France and somewhere and you pay exorbitant price for that you can do it for a fraction of that cost as part of now that means land policies can we have land uh, housing policies which say housing uh, systems will have a patch of land there's a park we, we have a park which is a law but we will have a patch of land which is for uh, production Cuba does it India does it, China does it, many many countries uh, in, in, in Asia where the elites have their own patches of land. Can we have laws doing that? Can we have laws doing that in Europe? And can Europeans also spend some time uh, tending to their patches of land and being partly producers? I mean, these are, these are ideas which we should be discussing and not shirking away. I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow, but we need new thinking. And I find, uh, what I find very, very distressing now is young people, and when you tell them, also tell me what's your dream? And they say, my dream is to have a car. I mean, having a car is not a dream, come on. Have a dream where, where you can think of something which looks undoable at this point of time. And we need to do that along with our practical things. Exactly. Now I'm glad you brought that up because, uh, as, as I say most of the time, that the Commons question is concerned with nature and knowledge, both. And um, knowledge. I mean, you know, there's a there's a famous uh, paragraph which Einstein wrote, and he said, "How does science progress?" And he said, "Science progresses because uh, newer uh, scientists." Uh, sit on the shoulders of the older scientists and are able to look a bit afar and uh, they look afar so they so science progresses then say new scientist sits on the shoulder of the older one and, and looks further and therefore um, construction of knowledge uh, is and uh, never been and is never kind of spontaneous individual effort it always is a accumulation of previous knowledge and, and um, cultural facts and that's how we have lived with knowledge knowledge has been the biggest common whether it's uh, music songs um, uh, or systemic knowledge like science or whatever it's always been a free resource and um, uh, we have not uh, had a regime where we, but but we have a regime where we recognize them. So you recognize some good work in science and you give a Nobel Prize. So this is a social prestige and you, you give a prize or you have a great work of music or you have a great film and you, uh, you give a prize to the film and so on. And, and we have lived with that kind of regime. Except that from 1995 we decided to have a regime in which we will give monopoly rights. To, to, to intellectual property and to knowledge. Uh, now, what that means is that you are look, looking at them like industrial products uh, in which you can get patents. And once you have a patent on your intellectual right, then you will receive royalties over a period of time. That's marketization of knowledge.
I'm, I'm deadly against it. Uh, I, I believe, first of all, it's uh, unethical because none of that knowledge comes. You know, most of the musicians who, who make a tune will have so many other tunes in mind from which they synthesize a new tune. Um, so for writing, for uh, I'm a physicist and that. You, you can't be a physicist without knowing the previous uh, history or before you invent something, if you at all invent something new. So, um, so I, I, I believe that um, in, in areas of knowledge and particularly what has happened, even today when we're listening to our friends from Balkan friends, they were talking about privatization of education uh, as a big issue in the Balkans. But we're always talking of privatization of education as privatization of reproduction of knowledge, which is privatization of school education, university education, and so on. But I think the bigger, bigger problem is the privatization of the production of knowledge, where it's being produced. We, we're not paying once once we are privatizing it at that level then the canvas changes the whole canvas changes then the institutions will be changed and everything else will be changed and um, and one area where this uh, has converged now the nature and knowledge is exactly in the uh, so called pat patenting of uh, genes and seeds where um, artifacts of nature which no one has produced uh, seeds are artifacts of nature genes are artifacts of nature and but, but you get some specialized knowledge about them and you can have monopoly right so knowledge and nature together have been made into a private entity which is to me the 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 final frontier of um, the obscenity of the market I would call it the really the obscenity of the market who how can you get rights on this then all the farmers have all the rights because most of the seeds in the world have come from work of farmers you don't recognize their right but you recognize the right of a some kind of a uh, corporation and its laboratory for doing that it's it's um, to my mind both unjust and 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 unethical uh, but we are in that framework and i think we need very strong uh, this has come to a head particularly with computer software uh, because software industry and Microsoft becoming the richest uh, corporation of the world is an intellectual property and not, not an industrial product. I don't think Marx would have ever envisaged that we, there will be a world when intellectual property will give surpluses and become make the biggest capitalist rather than industrial production. And I, I think the kind of resistances we find in computer software, we need to have those resistances in the other areas of knowledge, privatization. And I'm talking about free and open software systems where people have come together saying that we will write the codes. They're available as to a community. The community can modify them, change them, and put it back out there. And uh, it will grow in that manner. There will be no comp uh, licensing where you, proprietary licensing where you have to pay royalties. But, uh, but you can share it. And if you want to have shared systems you can do that I think a wonderful resistance system is the free and open software system and and since that has actually happened that gives you hope that you can create many such systems where you can question the marketization of knowledge and make it available free and I'm, I'm, I'm particularly um, uh, working towards seeing that uh, musicians um, and others have, do more work with copyleft rather than copyright.